I know you're not going to do. Because though I have done it, I know what it cost me and how hard it was for me to do. But there was a time, oh, not so long ago. Okay. Maybe it was a while ago. It was probably, oh, the first few years of my early Christian walk with the Lord. Yeah. I'd gotten saved and I had been moved out of the Marine Corps because of an uh, incurable disease. And I had gone to Modesto, California to uh, literally take up a job that my uncle was helping me get, get going and get on my feet. And so I stayed with him. And I was a born again Christian, you know, so I'm not sure what he expected or what I did. <laughs> But he worked at Gallo Winery, and so he got me a job, and I got hired on as a warehouse uh, stacker. Was that we would work on the conveyor belt, and we would take boxes that were full of glass wine bottles that were upside down in a case, and we would put our hands on them with a flap, flap, flip them upside down, spin, and place them on a pallet and then stack them up oh you know so high and it was pretty backbreaking work literally and uh, since I was out of the Marine Corps you know and barely out of the hospital you know my attitude was one that I could do it my body was one that said <laughs> you probably can't and my spirit was definitely struggling so combining all those I also at the same time was talking to my aunt about Jesus and about faith and my uncle I wasn't quite sure of you know I don't know where he came from but he was at night you know would have a glass of wine and talk about lots of subjects religion didn't seem to be one of I was a Jesus freak so <laughs> somehow if you know what I mean, there was going to be a confrontation sooner or later. And so, down the road, sure enough, you know, I uh, do my back out. I was doing my job, and I'd been there about, oh, maybe a week. And uh, my uncle was proud of me, and I was doing a good job. And so I threw my back out, and they took me to the nurse's station, and at the time they had me rest you know and so I rested and then I went back on the line and tried to work and couldn't they gave me a back brace and then tried to work and I couldn't so they put me on light duty so I went on light duty and I was there for about a week you know just kind of marking boxes and doing little things that was light duty only my crew that I was a part of I could see that their numbers, which was, we had quotas, you know, were falling and that they were really needing someone on their crew that was up to speed, that was staffs, like I had been somewhat, you know, and that was able to do the job. So I kind of watched that for a while and they never said anything to me and they never mentioned anything. But in the meantime, at home, at night, you know, I would talk to my aunt about Jesus. And uh, it was getting pretty good. She was very interested. So the next day, I went to work and I read my devotionals and it talked about trusting the Lord and going through fiery trials. I didn't pay too much attention to it, you know, and I was all excited about what was happening at home and then how, you know, the work was kind of going along, but it wasn't, you know, quite right. It just seemed like, well, maybe God wanted me to, you know, be a witness rather than, you know, work. And so I come into work and they put me back on the line and I threw my back out. Sure enough, it went out again. And it was 
very, very humbling because of so much pain and so much agony that I uh, went to my foreman and I said, you know, I said, I guess I'm just not cut out for this. I said, you know, I appreciate you know, the hard work and I appreciate the job, but, you know, I said, it just looks like I can't do it. And I said, so I don't know what you want to do, but I said, you know, I don't think I can do this job. I've thrown my back out twice now. And the crew's suffering for me going on light duty. And if you put me on light duty again, they're going to fall even farther behind. So maybe it's better if you hire someone else instead. And the foreman looked at me just dumbfounded and went, okay. And so I went home. And uh, when I got home, my uncle, you know, came home that night and I didn't get a chance to talk to him. So the next morning, I didn't get up for work, you know, and I didn't go to work. And so he I came out for breakfast, you know, and was going to make my breakfast. And he came out in his robe and he had his coffee cup. And he had, I don't know, maybe his donut. And he already had his keys. He says, I'll give you a ride. And I said, for what? And he said, I'll give you a ride to work. He says, looks like you're going to, you missed work. And I said, I quit. I said, I threw my back out two or three times. And as I watched his face, he's kind of a little guy, but he was ex-Navy. So I watched his face get beat red. I was explaining to him and I said, well, I prayed about it and I just felt like I couldn't do the job. So I wanted someone else to take the job. So I quit, you know, I just, I knew someone else needed to do it and I couldn't and my crew was suffering. And so I just told him that I couldn't do it. He almost dropped his coffee cup. I remember very vividly this whole incident. And so being a young man and him being an older man, he just saw me as a failure. And so he said, get out of my house. You put your clothes on. I'm taking you to work. You're getting your last check. You're getting on the plane and you're getting out of my house today. And I started bawling like a baby. <laughs> I started crying because you see, I grew up without a father. I never had a dad. The one stepdad that I had was so close in age to me that he was more like a kid, you know, and I never really, he never really gave me much advice because maybe he was kind of intimidated by me or something, but he never treated me much like a son. So my uncle, though I didn't know that well, I always looked up to and admired because he was seemed so wise and so intelligent and such a perfectionist that I thought he was like the greatest thing there was. And then when he blew up, I went to my room, was putting on my clothes and double checked my devotionals. I was talking to God and asking him why with tears in my eyes, streaming down, bawling like a baby, it's not my nose. Why are you putting me through this? What did I do wrong? What's wrong here? Blah, 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 blah. So, I'm all in tears. I read this devotional, Streams in the Desert, said something about Joseph and his brethren, and how Joseph had to go through all these trials, and how God worked it out in the end, and I was like, that's not what I want to hear. I want something else. So, my uncle takes me to work, and I go into Human Resources, and Human Resources says, well, she says, here's your check. You know, 24 hours, I know, it seems strange, but they had it. She says, well, we have your check, but she says, your foreman came in and said, you you were such a hard worker and you did such a good job that it would be a shame to lose you. Would you be interested in maybe taking a position inside the plant, you know, as a bottle inspector that you won't be in the warehouse, but you'll make more money and you'll have less physical work to do. You know, you just inspect the bottles. Of course, my eyes lit up. My faith soared like wings on eagles. I was like, suddenly all so thrilled. And so I said, sure, of course I would. 
So she said, well, here's your check and, you know, show up tomorrow, you know, come report to, and she gave me the, you know, the foreman in the place, you know, glass factory. And so I go out to tell my uncle. And my uncle starts screaming. All the way home in the car, he tells me, I want you out of my house today. I don't care how you do it. I don't care where you go. You get out of my house today. You take your check and you go get a place. Well, he left and then my aunt and I opened up the newspaper and, you know, she knew what he was like in that kind of fits of rage, which I had never seen. And we started going through the newspaper and she started talking to me about, well, what happened? You know, and I told her, well, you know, I prayed, I read this devotional, this is what God said. Then we went down to Gallo Winery and they offered me a job, so I took it. And bingo, you know, and she says, well, she says, I don't know if we're going to find anything. And I said, God will provide. I said, if he brought me this far, <laughs> I says, I'm not worried about it. I said, I'll sleep on the street, you know. So, long story short, I go to this woman who has two little tiny houses. This is in Modesto, California, in the old days. These were tiny little squat houses that like had been built like turn of the century. It had barren claw bathtubs. It was like a mom and a dad little houses. And she lived in the front one. They were both in one area. And they were all perfectly little cultivated and a little tiny, tiny, tiny house. So, little tiny lady. So I explained to her my situation and told her what I had. And she took my check. <laughs> took my money. You know, and then she said, you know, it sounds like you need, you know, a place to stay. And I said, yeah. She said, well, just give me your next check, pay me. You know, I said, okay. So that day I moved in with nothing and the house turned out to be furnished. And it was all in quaint, what we would say nowadays, antique, you know, stuff that, man, would have been worth a fortune. But I stayed in that house a year working for Gallo Winery in the glass factory. And my uncle didn't have anything to do with me. You know, he didn't want to talk to me. He didn't want to never see me again, really. And uh, it was rough. But the interesting thing was that at that point in time, I was so in love with God for what he had done for me and taking me through that experience with my uncle, my aunt, giving me the job, that I decided to follow something I wanted to do, which was to try walking in the spirit, you know, walking in a way that other people didn't do. So what I did was, I didn't have a car, so I had to buy a bicycle, so I had a bicycle, and uh, I'd ride it to work and back. And I didn't have a TV, so I didn't buy one. I didn't have a radio, so I didn't buy one. I spent almost a year without a TV, without a radio, without newspapers, and I didn't want to be distracted from reading my Bible, from studying the Word of God, from spending the quality time that I thought that if I walked in the Spirit, if I chose to develop that personal relationship, that I could control my thought life, my heart life, and my emotional life to such a degree that I could do like what God said we could do if we would let our eye be full of light and our heart be full of love and our soul be permeated by the joy of a relationship with God. <laughs> and you know, it worked. <laughs> it was, I felt like I was walking six feet off the ground half the time. It was one of the most unique, marvelous, beautiful experiences of my life. God was so real. Jesus was so personal. I heard teachings and studied in ways that you know, I never had an opportunity to ever do again. And I just loved it. I'll admit, I was a little starved for fellowship. But it was that time apart that even Paul did when he got saved. You know, I needed my own time apart from everyone and everything to really know what it was that God had done in my life and to know what it meant to really walk in the Spirit. Because I'd already been filled, I'd already been baptized, I already had all these really outrageous gifts, all kinds of things. I'd already done them, did them, been there, done that. But now, I needed that fruit to just be manifested 
in such a way that I could prove that in this life, though it may not last as long as you may want it to, you could walk, talk, and live, not just in the Spirit, with the Spirit, but with Jesus. And I don't say you should go and be a monk, because I lived in the world. I don't think you should go and join a monastery, because I went to work, you know. And I don't say that bad things won't happen, because what ended my time was I caught pneumonia, and when I turned to my uncle, he wasn't going to help me, so my family came up and brought me back to Southern Cal. But the wonder of walking with God, the joy of knowing His Spirit, the intensity that I had was all because of taking my mind off of the things of the world and focusing them in on God Himself. Maybe this devotional I'm about to read will apply. And maybe we can't live it. Or maybe we could try. But for me, <laughs> I don't like to say been there, done that too often, but this old Jesus Gypsy, he's tried a lot, done a lot. I gotta admit, you can do it. The devotional life is almost crowded out. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without. First Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12. We Christians must simplify our lives or lose untold treasures on earth and in eternity. Modern civilization is so complex as to make the devotional life all but impossible, multiplying distractions and beating us down by destroying our solitude. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still is a wise and healing counsel. But how can it be followed in this day of the newspaper, the telephone, the radio, the television, the iPod, the iMax, the iThis, the iThis, the iDo? You know, if you added anything else with an I in it, you'd realize it's an idol. <laughs> These modern playthings, like pet tiger cubs, have grown so large and dangerous that they threaten to devour us all. No spot is now safe from the world's intrusion. One way the civilized world destroys men is by preventing them from thinking their own thoughts. Our vastly improved methods of communication, of which the short-sighted boast so loudly, now enable a few men in strategic centers to feed into millions of minds alien thought stuff and ready-made and pre-digested false tabloid Christianity and ideas that they never would have thought of on their own and never would believe except someone had told them. <laughs> The need for solitude and quietness was never greater than it is today. Even the majority of Christians are so completely conformed to this present age that they too want things the way they are. They would rather have God invade their technology than set the technology aside and invade where God is. How dare we not choose to step out of what we can see, touch, and feel and move into the highest heaven, as Paul did, but instead create our own world and universe in the cyber sector and create a cyber Christianity that we think is like him. Do you realize today God could reveal, take you up into heaven and then bring you back to earth? Or would you rather see that on the internet? They want to relearn the ways of solitude and simplicity and gain the infinite riches of the interior life. They want to discover the blessedness of what has been called the spiritual aloneness, a discipline that will go far in making us acquainted with God and our own souls, but they are not willing to pay the price. Because what is the price? Is it our great cathedrals of churches that we now make campuses of cyber connectivity and we can relate to each other in a fantastical way that we can change the image of God as he is into the image what we want to create him to be by photoshopping him, photoshopping him, photo creating him into something that he did not say and did not do and is not. I for myself as a network engineer, as a person who works on the internet, as a techie, as a geek, know for a fact that should this generation not have been shortened and we are and should it be that we weren't in the last generation which we are that 
God would be recreated into the image of man, as already the scriptures are being distorted greatly by posters and taking things out of context and trying to say that that's what the Bible says, rather than what the Bible says. So, on the one hand, I say, oh, I loved the time of solitude that I had when I spent that time alone with God. And there are times in the summer where look, my wife and I, we go camping far away from everyone. So we have no cell phone and we have no modern conveniences or anything. We could just spend some quiet time to just detox our cyber, cyber text that we have so infused our lives with. And people are amazed that we go that far out in a way to be away from everything. And God meets us there. <laughs> it's funny. Someday, you know, I mean, I said it on another video, but when I went out camping, we even found a toilet seat, you know, and a commode that was already pre-made. So we moved it to our campsite. Wow, imagine that. Out in the middle of nowhere. God provided. My wife loved it. <laughs> and she'll tell you the story. But the point being is that as I am also in technology, I recognize that there must be a balance. There must be that continuity of the recognition that it's not all technology and it's not all rejection of technology. But somewhere in between, you need to find that the tools that you use don't create God, but that God wants to recreate you by the tools you're using to come to Him, not bring Him to you. Because the reality is, in that time that I spent alone with God, there is no doubt that what Paul said, whether in the body or out, I know not which, but I know a man that went up into the heavens and to speak of things that are not there would be a sin for how great is that reality that goes on in the heavens than that which exists here on earth. Because you have no idea whether from science fiction or from any other source except the Word of God what reality is when it comes to God in the heavens and how little it matches cyber gods in the technology circuit of tabloid Christianity and the cyber Christian. Get alone. Get real and find out God is real. He's not an auto program that you programmed in for iPod to send you a scripture every day. That's not God speaking. When God wants to talk, He'll talk to you direct. And not only that, to find out what the fear of the Lord is, He'll reveal Himself to you. And you'll have no doubt about it. You may not be able to use the right words to define it because it's kind of hard to define, but when you are in the presence of God, you will know what the fear of the Lord is. You'll never be able to examine it or to explain it the same way again. May I say that in this devotional, try to get alone. Try it. Try to get away from it all. To find God. So you don't lose sight of who He is. And who Jesus has become in your life. As He wants to draw you back unto Himself.